All right. Welcome to session 3C at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Diana Morganti. I use she, her pronouns. I am one of the STEM librarians here at Texas A&M University, but I'm also a member of the TCDL Planning Committee, and I'm pleased to be your session moderator today. First, some housekeeping. Texas Digital Library and the TCDL Planning Committee um, are committed to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. We ask that everyone here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior in speech, and be mindful of your environment and your fellow participants. I've put a link to our full code of conduct on tdl.org in the chat. This session will run until about 11.50 a.m. Please feel free to take breaks as you need. Uh, again, I invite you to say hello in chat and let us know where you're joining from. Share some resources, make comments throughout today's session. I'll be watching for questions in chat and I'll share them with our speakers during the Q&A portion at the end. Um, and now on with the show. I'm pleased to introduce our first presentation. I solemnly swear I will finish this project, tackling a long-term digital preservation project presented by Kristen Clark, Manager of Digital Collections from Texas Women's University. I'll hand things over to you now to get started, Kristen. Thank you, Diana. Um, and hello, everyone. I'm Kristen Clark. And as Diana said, I am the Manager of Digital Collections at Texas Women's University Libraries. And it's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to be presenting about TW Library's first digital preservation project, which I started in the fall of 2020, and I continue to work on today. Uh, next slide, please. All right, first, I will give you a little overview of the collection that we're working with. The collection was transferred to the University Archives by TWU's Department of Marketing and Communications in August of 2015. It is 60 cubic feet of boxes containing binders of CD-ROMs and photograph contact sheets. On the CDs are born digital images created by photographers contracted by TWU from roughly 2003 to 2015. If you don't know what a contact sheet is, it's a sheet filled with all photos from a photo shoot and the image to the right uh, shows an example of these. These photos were of commencement ceremonies, headshots, university events, construction and promotional images. Uh, the collection was stored in one of two climate controlled vault vaults in the special collections department. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so the overarching reason we began the digital preservation of this collection was to gain space in our high priority vault. Um, Space is a premium for archives and the library, the TW libraries currently doesn't have any offsite storage space for special collections. And um, plans for new large donations were on the horizon and the special collections and university archives department, which I was part of at the time, was trying to think of creative solutions to gain more climate controlled storage space. Uh, this collection took up a lot of space, 60 cubic feet roughly, and our plan was that if we could extract all of the images off the disks, uh, we might be able to make this collection completely digital, or if not that, at least retain the CD-ROMs without the contact sheets and collapse this, the collection significantly. From an archival standpoint, these CDs housed the visual history of the university from the early 2000s. And if action was not taken to transfer the materials from the CD-ROMs, the digital content could be lost permanently. And as I discovered, once I began the project, we were almost already too late. <laughs> um, we also knew that the collection was very difficult to use in its current state. Past requests for marketing for images in this collection were timely to complete as the collection was still organized according to marketing's internal organizational system and no arrangement had been um, performed. We knew um, we wanted to create a database for archivists to, to utilize when filling a reference request. And this database would capture the original organizational system of the collection. What we did not know at the beginning of the project was that marketing also wanted all of the contact sheets to be digital and to have access to those. 
not all of the contact sheets were born digital. Um, so this was something we had to add on later in the project. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so these are the phases of the project as we now know them. We started this project in the fall of 2020, and in the beginning, we knew there would be at least two phases, a digital processing phase and a physical processing phase. After, after having over five student workers involved in the project, though, we decided to add in a review stage where we would check that all steps were complete and all documentation, uh, required documentation was there. Um, so the first stage, is the digital processing and the digital preservation. Um, it's where we transferred all of the CDs uh, or all of the images off of the CD-ROMs and transferred them to our local um, storage server. Uh, we created the metadata at the, at the time of extraction and um, after they were extracted, we assessed for preservation and then ingested um, priority um, events and images into preservation storage. Phase two was the is the processing, like the physical processing of the collection. So um, it's the basic debinding of the collection and organization. And at that point, we reviewed the metadata and the contact sheets um, for digitization and then created a, to create, and then we would create a Google shared drive um, for marketing an access, an access point for marketing. And then the last phase is the actual weeding and final organization of it and the collapsing of the collection. So we projected the first phase to take about two years and hope to perform phase two concurrently for boxes that had already gone through phase one. So we weren't completing one phase and then moving to the next. We kind of were going along at the same time. All right, next slide, please. So when I started the project, I was working re partly remotely and I started by dedicating my remote days to figuring out what the process should be for copying the files from the disks to local storage. I checked boxes out and copied the files from the CDs to Google Drive at home. The upload process was slow into Google and often timed out. So I would work on other things while the images were copying over. Um, I found that Firefox worked better than Chrome, but it still was not extremely efficient. On the days I would go into the office, I would transfer all of the files from Google Drive to our local servers. I tested working on the transfer of the files in the office and it was much faster and had less problems, but not none. Um, from, from this knowledge, I knew that it was better to work on site on this project um, than remotely, but it could be done remotely if needed. Um, and which is pretty much what we did because it was needed in the spring of 2021. So for the spring of 2021, um, this project was mostly worked on remotely by me and two other students so we could have dedicated time to it. Starting in the summer of 2021, students could no longer work remotely um, per university regulations. And that's when the project was able to really speed up because it could be on site. The remote work, the, the remote work time allowed us to slowly figure out the project and iron out the process. So when the students came into the office, we were ready to go. As we moved into the office, we transitioned away from using Google Drive in our transfer process to transferring straight to local storage, which was significantly faster. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right, so when first considering how to work on this project remotely, the main issue was that laptops don't have disk drives anymore. Um, so how could students run, run the CD-ROMs? Um, one student did have a disk drive um, on her laptop, so she was the first to begin the remote work, and we ordered two more external CD drives for students to check out for work on the project. We also had CDs consistently failing while copying. Uh, CDs that failed at home, I would bring into the office and try on my work computer, and taking the middleman that was Google Drive out helped, but some CDs, but not uh, helped with some CDs, but not all of them. As we went along, failing CDs became more and more frequent and less and less were able to be read by on-site computers. Um, we found that one of the photographers always put labels on their CDs, and these were the ones that consistently had errors. As it goes, of course, this person was the most used contractor by the university and the majority of the CDs were theirs. Um, we also started running out of local 
server space um, we were because we were extracting a lot of data from these disks and we weren't actively putting in materials into preservation storage because that was still preservation storage was still brand new to us um, so we hadn't really figured that out yet um, IT was and still is understaffed um, at TWU. So we flipped back to using Google Drive when we ran out of server space until IT was able to increase the storage size. So even though like our Google Drive workflow had its problems, it still saved us when we had no local server space for a time. Um, and speaking of time, that was another issue when working on this project because it took a lot of it. We were limited to the amount of students we could have in the office at one time, and they often worked on multiple projects, with this project being the lowest priority. I had students dedicate a few hours to it every week so it could keep going, but no student was able to solely work on this. Uh, next slide, please. We found that incorporating digital preservation tools into our workflows helped this project significantly. I had never used any digital preservation tools prior to this, so this was all brand new to me. TW Libraries had recently signed on to using TDL's digital preservation service, and I was able to utilize the support provided through that service to figure out what I could do about the failing disks. Thank you, Courtney. Um, TDL suggested the software DD Rescue as a solution for us to try for these failing disks. Um, DD Rescue, copies data from a device such as a CD and tries to rescue the good parts first in case of read errors. If you have multiple copies of the same CD and all are failing, it's most likely that they're not failing in the same place every time. So therefore, if you have multiple copies of a damaged file, which we, which we did, um, often three or four copies of the same CD, um, DD Rescue is able to piece together a complete version of a file from the copies. We were able to outfit a laptop with Ubuntu to run the software, and as students came across failing disks, they would give them to me with any duplicates, and I would run the software to transfer what images I could. DD Rescue was able to recover all data from a failing disk about 80% of the time, which was definitely an improvement from no data. Um, we documented this preservation activity in the metadata and noted when not all files could be extracted. TerraCopy was another tool we incorporated into our workflow because it also let us use those duplicate CDs um, and it would copy more efficiently than Windows. Uh, also, it would generate checksums and verify checksums um, after transfer. We used TerraCopy in our first step to transfer files from the CDs to local storage. And when a CD crashed, crashed we could eject it, <clears throat> insert a duplicate and resume the copying where it left off. After incorporating TerraCopy, we had less CDs that needed to be run through DD Rescue, so it was definitely helpful. Next slide, please. All right, as I noted before, TW had recently signed on to TDL's digital preservation service, and these files were our first test of uploading items into dark storage. SC, um, Special Collections and University Archives appraised and selected items for preservation in batches at the folder level, and then I prepped and sent the files to storage. We currently have almost 64 gigabytes of materials in this collection stored in Amazon Glacier. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, to keep things moving along, we decided to start phase two, the physical processing for boxes that had already undergone digital processing. Students debindered the collections and sorted the disks and documentation into folders. We knew we needed to add in that staff review phase that, that I mentioned prior. Um, and we also learned at this point that marketing wanted all of those contact sheets that were in the CDs, that were with the CDs um, in a digital format so they could access them. Um, so some of the contact sheets, some of the CDs had contact sheets on them, but the majority did not. So we decided to combine that metadata review with the digitization review as we were already going to be looking through the newly processed boxes. Um, we identified contact sheets that needed to be digitized and had students scan them using a feeder scanner. I then created a Google shared drive into which I uploaded the metadata files and the contact sheets for each CD. And uh, this drive will be shared with marketing so they can access these materials, but we haven't got there just yet. Next slide, please. So how far are we along now? 
Uh, we're almost done with phase one. So that's kind of going along our original timeline and we've started phase two. This project was always a back burner project um, and something that could be started and stopped when a student had no other priority task. Uh, and because of this and really the sheer size, it's been slow going. We are over a, a year into this project and um, unfortunately has been put on pause since January of 2020 when the library underwent a reorganization. Since January, figuring out new departmental workflows has been the priority and digital preservation as it often does took a backseat. Things are settling in now and I'm in the process of hiring a student worker for this summer to start to restart work on this project. I was very glad that I spent so much time in the beginning um, writing very detailed workflow documentation because it has made training and cross-training significantly easier. Due to the reorganization, special collections will now lead the processing and organization phases of the project, and I'm now solely focused on the digital side. Uh, this has made it much more manageable in my mind, but um, I will need to do some reworking of the workflows again to accommodate uh, cross-departmental collaboration. Next slide, please. This project has been such a great way to get our feet wet with digital preservation and managing digital preservation projects, but it's been kind of a beast. Uh, as with most things, we thought it would be simpler in the beginning than it ended up really being, but it, was it has definitely been a huge learning experience. Making sure to have really solid document instructions and documentation and dedicating student time to it every week is how we've gotten this far and how we're going to get it finished. Um, if I had a time turner, I would do more upfront storage planning and have had more detailed conversations with our stakeholders prior to beginning uh, this project so we didn't have to backtrack so much. Um, this being our first digital preservation project, it being very big, it being during the pandemic with a library reorg happening, just all added extra layers of challenge. But I'm just figuring out as I go along and I will take what I've learned from this project and apply it to our next one. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much to Kristen. Um, I'm going to remove the spotlight off her and as our next presenter, Catherine, starts screen sharing, um, I'm going to introduce her and her presentation. Uh, just a reminder that we're going to do Q&A at the end. You are welcome to go ahead and put it into chat and I will um, save it and ask our presenters after or you're also welcome to um, save it for later and unmute and speak your question aloud. With that, I will introduce our speaker for the next talk. This is the way choosing the right digital preservation tools for your institution from Catherine Slover, digital archivist at the University of Texas at Arlington. Catherine, you are ready to go. Hey, great. Thank you, Diana. Um, hi, everyone. So as Diana said, I am Catherine Slover, the digital archivist at the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I know my title might seem a little obscure for those of you who aren't super familiar with Star Wars. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of background, but I promise not to get too into the weeds with this level of nerdiness. Um, where's my slide ahead? So, um, what exactly is a Mandalorian? In the Star Wars universe, the Mandalorians um, were a group that was composed of men members of multiple species that were bound by a common creed, language, and code. Throughout Mandalore's history, they've been a war-driven people, they've been a peaceful people, but after the tragic events of the Great Purge, Mandalorians were forced into hiding and various philosophies emerged among different groups. For those of you not familiar with the show, The Mandalorian, it follows Din Djarin, a bounty hunter, um, a bounty hunter who is part of one of the Mandalorian sects that follows a really strict creed, including never removing their helmets in front of others. This sect can be identified by their signature phrase and the title of this presentation, This is the Way. On his journey, Din encounters others of his kind who do not strictly follow the same set of rules. So the more imp important question here is, what does this have to do with digital preservation? Um, 
Din learns that there's no one way to be a Mandalorian. The rules and regulations he was raised to follow are one way, but there are many others who don't adhere to this path, but that doesn't make them any less um, Mandalorian. Similarly, in the field of digital archive, there's no singular solution to preserve digital materials. Each institution has different needs, resources, and goals, and digital preservation practitioners must recognize that there are a variety of solutions that, to the challenges that they face. And this presentation is going to chart our course um, taken at UTA libraries through the early stages of our digital preservation efforts that eventually led us to select Preservica as our main digital preservation solution. But this overview isn't intended to really be a one size fits all, but sort of a guide to help other institutions that might be considering um, you know, the next steps forward and how they wanna handle digital preservation. So I was hired at UTA in August of 2020. And really my first main task was figuring out what we were gonna do about our digital material. Um, after a few months of sort of assessing my job, the library, special collections, um, I organized the digital preservation task force. It consisted of staff from special collections, IT, digitization, um, data services, and publishing. Um, to create this task force, we wanted to make sure that all of the voices involved in any aspect of digital preservation were represented. Um, you know, I contacted individuals specifically who I knew would be involved, but I also put out a call um, to all library staff. Um, and there were some people who wanted to be a part of it, and even though at first I didn't think um, their roles really fit into it. Um, you know, after thinking about it, I'd realize, you know, oh, okay, that, that department does sort of fit into our digital preservation work. And um, until we, we reached out to everyone, um, we didn't really consider that. And I think there were a few factors that helped make this task force really successful. Um, the first was getting everybody up to speed on, on the work that we were doing. Um, between all of the different departments, we had different experiences and ideas about what the term digital preservation means, right? I'm sure that a lot of y'all are familiar with sort of that balance between like archives digital preservation and IT digital preservation, I think is the most common one. Um, but we had several new staff members from these departments. And so we kind of got to start from scratch about what this meant for us and the libraries and how we wanted to move forward with it. Um, and I created what was basically a literature review of sorts that identified some of the main definitions, a brief history, um, ongoing best practices and trends of digital preservation from an archives perspective. Um, to disperse to the task force. And it created an opportunity for people to ask questions and for us to all learn from each other um, about, you know, like I said, I'm coming at it from an archives perspective, but IT and data services and publishing are coming at it from this other, other area. And so, um, you know, it gave us all an opportunity to discuss and sort of get on the same page. And it also gave me an opportunity to do some research and make sure I was up to date on best practices and the latest discussions. Um, I came from a role where I was doing digital preservation work, but as we all know, this field moves really quickly and there's always something new to learn. And so doing this sort of research for the task force to get us all on the same page, um, you know, helped bring me a little bit more up to speed. Although I don't, I'm not convinced that we can ever like know it all, right? So there's always more to learn. Um, two other things that really helped make this task force successful were determining a timeline for the work and setting goals and desired outcomes. Um, to be clear, not every deadline was met um, for various reasons, mostly because trying to get 11 people in one virtual meeting in a world where we're doing probably too many virtual meetings <laughs> was really difficult. Um, but setting the goals and deadlines really helped keep us on track for where we wanted to be because we wanted to move quickly to get this done because it was urgent and um, we didn't really have time to waste. And I think the most important thing that really helped um, make this task, task force successful and um, really 
helped guide our digital preservation work was creating a digital preservation policy at the very beginning. Um, you know, the policy is essential in building a sustainable program and it's what's gonna guide our work moving forward. Um, the digital preservation policy defined the purpose of digital preservation at UTA, the scope, it delineated roles and responsibilities between all of those departments that I mentioned. Um, it defined the criteria of success of what you know we thought was successful, which of course will be different for every institution. Um, our objectives and goals, not just for this task force, but you know, in five years and ten years, and um, you know, so it sort of laid out all of those sorts of things. Um, and most importantly, the policy showed library administration and the university why digital preservation is not just important, but it's absolutely necessary. That was sort of the main thing is we wanted that core document to be our guiding practices and principles for everything we were going to do moving forward. Um, and I think with this aspect, especially one of the most important things that was useful was not recreating the wheel. There were some really well done digital preservation policies that I used as a guide, some of them from institutions right here in Texas. Um, I reached out to some of these institutions, got feedback about how they created them. Um, you know, I got to learn from their experience and their documentation. Um, and I think this goes for a lot of aspects of digital preservation work. This is a really amazing community that does really great things. And the support we show each other, even when we're not doing the work the same way, um, is really impactful. And so it was really core to these sort of early stages in, like I said, setting goals, creating policies and getting that sort of core base. Um, you know, all of these are gonna vary institution to institution. Um, but I think that having input from staff um, that are gonna be involved, setting those goals and deadlines and creating the policy really are the essential, you know, first steps that help, helped us find our base before we could move forward. Um, so after we wrote the digital preservation policy, the next step was doing an assessment. Um, completing an assessment was critical for us in moving forward with our work. Um, and the goal was to understand what our technological, financial, and staff resources were. And it also served to help us understand what digital materials we have in our possession to preserve now and what we hope to acquire in the future. Um, and by seeing where we were at, we could take better steps to um, toward our future goals. So there's several different digital preservation assessment tools and what you decide is really dependent on your long-term goals um, and where you're at in the process, right? We were very much just getting started, but some people are like way ahead of us. And so they might need not need to do the same types of assessments that we did. Um, and I've listed a few options on the slide, um, the Digital Preservation Coalition Rapid Assessment Model, NDSA Levels of Preservation, um, the NEDC Peer Assessment, there are paid vendor assessments you can do. There are a lot of a lot of others that you could add to this list, but those are just a couple of examples. Um, and you know they have different focuses. And so we ultimately chose to go with the Digital Preservation Coalition Rapid Assessment Model because it provided a more holistic approach. Um, and considering we hadn't done an assessment before, we really needed to get a broad look at everything. Um, and, you know, from the digital material we had to, you know, I coming in, I didn't really know what sort of resources we had in terms of, you know, financial staff um, and technological. Um, but like I said, for an institution that's already doing this type of work, you know, the NDSA levels of preservation may be a more appropriate model. So it really just depends. But for us, that rapid assessment model um, was the right choice. And we moved rather quickly through this phase of our work, but that was mostly because this was my core duty at the time. This is literally what I was hired to do. Um, and I know that that's not the case for a lot of people that are doing this work, um, but this was my, my core focus. You know, we were still close to the public, so I wasn't doing reference. Um, I was working on like web archiving, but you know, this was it. And so I had a lot of time to dedicate to this. And so 
like I said, we move through the process rather quickly, um, but I think understanding that moving at your own speed to do this kind of work is important. Um, I talked to a few practitioners who had done assessments and some, you know, took a lot longer than we did. Some did theirs a lot quicker than we did. At first I was kind of anxious because we weren't sort of leveling up with everyone, but then I realized that like, you know, like I said, we're all coming from different spaces. And so um, I learned really quickly not to compare ourselves and what we were doing to other institutions. Um, obviously we wanted to work or learn from others, but, um, you know, keeping that in mind for me was really important. Um, and I think for those who are planning an assessment, another thing that was really helpful um, that someone told me was that not everything in these assessments is going to be relevant to what you're doing. Um, so let, the rapid assessment models has all these criteria, um, but not all of those things were really actually relevant to what we needed to assess. And so instead of doing the work to try to figure out what might fit into this, we didn't use all of them and we added in some things of our own, some criteria of our own that we wanted to look at. Um, and so, you know, being flexible with your assessment and um, doing what works best for you. Because like I said, everything is going to be dependent on your needs and your goals. Um, this assessment was one of the most critical stages for us. Um, especially when we were looking at all of our digital assets and resources and what we would need to care for these. There were things that we had stored somewhere that I didn't even know existed until I, I was interviewing people and they were like, oh yeah, don't you know there's this hard drive over here? Or, oh yeah, we, we use this system to store our AV material. And I'm like, I've literally never heard of this. And so, you know, I was like six months into the job and I'm learning all of this stuff. And so this was really important for me because over the years, people have sort of hodgepodge solutions together as again, as I'm sure most of you have experienced. And so we, we took this time to try to find all of those. Um, I will say we didn't get them all. Things still have popped up since this. Um, so, you know, nothing is perfect, but um, doing this assessment really was a game changer for us. So once the assessment was complete, we used what we knew about our current state, or in some cases lack thereof, of digital preservation um, and our future goals to create a rubric for assessing solutions. In context, by solutions, what I'm really talking about is we were looking for a digital repository that included storage, preservation, and access. Um, we evaluated a variety of different solutions based on the rubric, and we used that rubric to narrow down um, the solutions we wanted to look at in more detail. Um, you know, for some of them, we, we needed to contact vendors and things, and basically we didn't want to be dealing with like 10 vendors trying to sort all of that out. So we wanted to get it down to a smaller list before we got to that point. Um, but others may, may chose, choose to different, go a different way. Um, and we ended up doing a more in-depth exploration of LibNova's LibSafe product and um, Preservica. Um, we thought that those based on our assessment and our goals and um, our needs, those two were the closest of what we were looking for. And so, um, those were the two we decided to explore further. And this in-depth exploration really, you know, it included demos, meetings with vendors, meetings with the task force, meetings with departments. Um, there were a lot of meetings involved. Um, and in our case, we didn't do this, but this would be the time for doing like trials. And I know a lot of open source solutions have that sort of sandbox to test and play around. Um, we decided not to do that based on the solutions we were exploring further and my familiarity with them. But, you know, that's sort of the types of things that can go on in this like further exploration stage. Um, and when we were evaluating these options, we looked at everything we considered important to our long-term long goals, um, you know, including customization, automation, um, ease of use, not only on the user side, but on um, you know the staff side of things. Not that I intend on leaving UTA, but you know part of the reason we were sort of in this hodgepodge of solutions um, is because 
somebody left and the the new person didn't know how to pick it up. And so, you know, without proper documentation and a system that's fairly easy to, to use, sometimes, you know, you lose that institutional knowledge and we wanted to build something sustainable. So we wanted a system that had that ease of use built into it already. Um, and but also like something like I said we could customize we didn't necessarily need an out-of-the-box solution but it just needed to be something that could carry on beyond me um, and for things that we can train students and other staff on as the program grows um, like I mentioned we were looking specifically for access that was a really important piece for us to have a public access portal not for all of the digital material but um, for a lot of it um, storage technical support. Um, I'm one person and I'm the only one who really, I, the only person who does the digital processing and ingest of the materials. And so, and our IT department is wonderful, but they have so much to do. Um, and so after talking with them, you know, they really were on board with getting a system that included that technical support. So they, we didn't have to rely on them um, for that, you know, Continued monitoring and preservation are kind of a given, right, with this, what we were looking for. Um, room for future growth, you know, we wanted to select something that was, uh, you know, not just going to work for the next five years, but 10 years, 20 years into the future is, you know, and of course we can't know what things are going to look like, right, um, but the plan was to select something that was going to work for us long term. Um, and lastly, we were looking at cost. Obviously, cost is an issue with this kind of work. Again, as I'm sure you were all aware of, um, and not just financial cost, but time, right, is, is key too. And so um, those were things that we were all considering. And eventually, based on our criteria, we selected Preservica. Um, we submitted a report of our assessment findings based on the rapid assessment model and recommended to the library administration and it was approved, thankfully, yay. Um, I think that in our case, this work was already deemed mission critical. Like I said, I was hired with the intention that this was gonna be one of the first things that I completed. And so um, we didn't really have that uphill battle in terms of arguing like that this matters and this needs to be a priority but you know other places are going to have a different experience than that and so um you know i was prepared for that um which is why we did the assessment why we you know did this level of research why we had a task force of people that were saying this is the solution that is the best fit for us um and so, like I said, we didn't have that uphill battle, but we were prepared for it if we needed it. Um, and we were really lucky that, you know, administration saw that despite the cost of Preservica, um, that this was the best solution for our long-term goals, given the time and staff were able to dedicate to this. Um, but obviously this is not the way for everybody. <laughs> I'm missing a slide, but that's okay. Um, so after all of this and a lot of troubleshooting with Preservica support, um, as I'm still learning the system, we launched the UTA Libraries Digital Archive this month. I think it was actually like two weeks ago. Um, we made it live. Um, and this specifically houses our born digital and select digitized material. And our goal is to make most things we ingest publicly accessible. Uh, that's not obviously gonna be the case for everything, right? Um, and we have ingested collections from the university archives, our photograph collections, and our historical manuscript collections. And hopefully, um, once we hire a new labor archivist, we're hoping to acquire our firstborn digital labor collection. Um, we've been in the early stages of conversations with the donor about that. And so it's really exciting time. And I'm about to hire a student to assist with this work and hopefully can have a team of students that are going to be assisting with this work um, and so we, we've really come a long way from that you know beginning stages of the task force um, but what would a project be without a sarlacc pit of problems um, which we of course face this was not you know all of these steps were super helpful but you know there are a few lessons learned that i came out of this with um, 
the first, um, and this really applies to everything, is that communication is key with so many different stakeholders. Um, it's essential to communicate clearly and effectively throughout the process, and everyone's experiences are different, and sometimes it takes that communication factor to make sure you're staying on the same page. Um, you know, I think, like I said, in those one on one meetings that things came up that I was like, wait, what is what are we dealing with here? Like, what is this hard drive that's stored in some other room in the library that I've never heard of? You know, I wouldn't have known that if we didn't have those those, um, you know, communication as as part of our our sort of one of our core principles. Um, in that same regard, um, role delineation and collaboration are just as important. Again, working with so many different stakeholders, figuring out who's doing what can really streamline the whole process. This was the first time I've ever led a task force or anything even remotely close to one. Um, so I had trouble at the beginning sort of delegating and figuring out, you know, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to impose on people and I didn't want to be like, oh, can you do this for me, you know, but then I realized that agreeing to be part of this task force um, was, you know, they were interested in doing this work and assisting with this work. So I was able to really learn how to work with them to figure out, you know, what tasks were better suited to different people, what people were interested in researching versus, you know, something that they were like, oh, that's cool, but I don't really want to do that, um, to figure out, you know, who was going to take on what role in this process. Um, and, you know, in different places, you might be working with more or less people that require a sort of different setup of folks that are working on this in different ways. But either way, I think figuring out who's doing what and um, is one of the keys we had to efficiency. Um, documentation, <laughs> um, write everything down throughout the process is something that I would recommend and document it all. Even if you think maybe no one cares about this, it might be important when you're nearing the end and writing that report or submitting um, you know, solutions to your administration, um, you know, why didn't you do this, or why didn't you look at this option, or, you know, keeping a record of all of that throughout this, um, and when you're reviewing these solutions and policies and procedures, which you should be doing regularly, or more likely someone else is doing it, and then has a million questions, you want to make sure all of that is documented. Um, and lastly, you know, remembering that there's no one right way to do digital preservation. Um, again, like I said, that was something that I sort of had to figure out that like, even though this place was doing this, it's okay that we were taking a different route and how we, how we got to the solution. Um, you know, in an effort to complete his mission to save Grogu, AKA Baby Yoda, um, Din challenges what he thought was the only way to take, um, what he thought was the only way, and he eventually takes off his helmet to complete his mission. Like Din, digital preservation practitioners have to acknowledge the different but equally important paths to preserving digital materials. And that is all I have for you, so thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you to Kristen as well. I appreciate both of you so much. I am now gonna open us up to Q&A. So this is Q&A for both sessions. Please feel free to raise your hand to ask a question verbally or type your questions. And if you type, I will read your question aloud without your name. I have a few of my own if they are slow in coming in. Um, ah, okay, so we have our first one. This one's for Catherine. Is your DP literature review or bibliography available online? It is not online, but um, because it was sort of an informal thing, but if you would like it, I can send it to you. <laughs> it's focused sort of, it's got a UTA focus, but I can, um, if I can put my email in the chat and if you want to email me, I can send you a copy of it and anything else that you might want. By the way, both presentations also are available in SCED. Which leads me to this question, which I'm taking from the chat. Before the session, you guys had a fun chat about your presentation themes that only I got to hear. And so um, I want to hear the content questions also, but I love hearing about presentation design. So how did you each choose your presentation design? 
I just wanted something that was Harry Pottery to make it fun because <laughs> I feel like digital preservation cannot isn't always like the most exciting thing. So it helped me. Um, it helped me with motivation. And I just love Harry Potter. So <laughs> um honestly I was watching uh The Empire Strikes Back and uh obviously you have you see Boba Fett, right? And we had recently been watching The Mandalorian and I just had this like epiphany that like, you know, there's no one way to be a Mandalorian. And I I can't explain it, but it was just like this moment where I was like, somehow this relates to digital preservation. And I'd been wanting to find a, like you said, sometimes it's not the most exciting thing. So I've been wanting to find a theme to make it work and, and this just seemed to fit. So I guess we can thank George Lucas for that. Oh, Kristen, you have a question in chat now. Was the transition to Amazon Glacier required by contract or was that felt to be the best option for your project? It wasn't required. Um, we just knew that we had a lot of data from, from this collection that we would want to preserve. And since we were doing this work and we had the metadata files being actively created, we thought it was a great um, kind of pilot for testing out um, that upload into, into Amazon Glacier with the digital preservation service. Um, so it wasn't required, but it was a kind of a really easy, ready to go um, way to test that out. And Courtney provided a little more information in chat also saying it's mediated Glacier via DuraCloud at TDL. So I don't see any hands, so I'm gonna ask another one of my questions. And Kristen, did y'all do any deduping? You definitely covered well why you wouldn't want to dedupe CDs before digitizing, but did you do any data or image deduping afterward? Actually, um, I have in the review stage because um, you know there's definitely duplicates, and I didn't want to have duplicate images because you know we didn't have we already didn't have enough space, um, so having extra duplicates in there, but we kept the the du we're keeping the duplicates um, right now of the of the CDs because if for some reason we needed those, um, that was often the only way to get that content is through using those duplicates. Um, but but yeah, I have deduped some of the um, the extracted images. And I think next is a hand from Courtney. Howdy, great job, everybody. Um, my question is for Catherine and. I asked this realizing you might not be able to say, but um, how much does Preservica cost you at UTA? And also, what is your exit strategy if you ever need to migrate? Um, so I, I don't think there's anything that says we can't say what we pay. <laughs> um, uh, it is, I believe, we have one terabyte of, of S3 uh, storage for um, access copies and one terabyte of Glacier storage for um, preservation copies. And I think it's around like 12,000 a year. And that includes all of the support and the access site and their, all, all of the, the functions of the, the service. Um, and our access strategy, um, that is a, a long question. Um, we talked to them really in depth um, about sort of, you know, getting our stuff out if we need to get our stuff out. Um, and um, I can, honestly, I'm sorry, I'm like blanking on all the specifics This happened so long ago and it's all in our documentation, but, um, that was one of the things that we asked that, I mean, we asked everybody that like, okay, what if we need to get our stuff out? Um, but I can, I can go back through our documentation and send anything, but um, I'm like totally, like I said, blanking on specifics, but we asked all of the vendors that we looked at, uh, you know, what, what happens when we need to get our stuff out? Like, how can we, how can we do that? Or if we need to, because um, we realized that that was important. Cause like I said, you can't, as much as we like to plan for the future, you can't always. 
So these will have to be our last two questions. Um, they are both for Catherine and you may have partially covered the first one, which is, can you share specific services from Preservica? And then the second one, they were curious about the task force at UTA, how often they met and how meetings were structured. And I love that stuff too. Um, so for the services, I'm not sure if you mean like, like what is all um, sort of included in the, the suite of what we, we get. So um, it is a sort of all-in-one system um, that includes ingest, storage, access, and continued preservation. I mean, there's work on our end to do all of that, but there's a lot of automation that can be included. Um, and that was something we were looking for. Like I said, we didn't want to um, Basically, we, we went with a more costly option up front because we realized to, to sort of replicate that on our side, if we were going with other resources, we need more people. And that wasn't something that we could do at this moment. And so, um, but if you have, I, I ha like I said, I still have all of the documentation. So if you have more specifics, I know we're running out of time about like, you know, specific functions, I can, I can send that kind of stuff to you. Um, and then for the task force, um, honestly, our meetings were not, we didn't have like a standing meeting every two weeks because there were 11 of us. And so it wasn't as consistent like that. But so we met um, at the very beginning to sort of identify like what we were doing, the game plan, the timeline, um, and we just continually met throughout each stage of the process. So. The, the initial review um, or the initial assessment like involves, you know, me meeting with members individually and then we met all together to discuss the assessment and make sure we weren't missing anything, um, you know, meeting throughout, evaluating different options, um, meeting after each vendor meeting. <laughs> um, so, and the meetings were structured, I mean, I would say I basically was leading the meeting, but they were more of an open discussion um, than anything, with the exception of meetings with the vendors, which were structured by them. Um, so it probably, if I would recommend this, probably more structure might help move the process along faster. Um, but like I said, we were struggling to get 11 people in the same place to all meet. Um, and so we kind of took meetings where we could get them. Um, well, thank you so much. That was our last question and we are at the end of our time. Um, thank you again to Kristen and Catherine and to everybody, please have a restful lunch break. The conference is on break and we will see you at one if you would like for one of our swag sessions. We have financial literacy and juggling for stress relief. If not, we'll see you back in the content sessions at two. Thanks everybody.